Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's video will be on tracking, and these motions require a complete one-to-one -one coordination with your movements and what's happening on screen. Now you might be surprised to know that you can already do these motions very well, but when applied to a target, then you can struggle to track and stay on, and constantly keep stopping your mouse. Take this smooth bot task for example. I can see it's making a basic movement up left with a couple of small jumps. If I was to make this movement on the mouse pad, sure, easy, I can do it smoothly too as required. However, when applied to a target as mentioned, you can see that I'm dropping off with my tracking. So a lot of this practice is actually towards gaining confidence and familiarity with the results of your movements. So I'm really emphasising that you can already do these, you just need to apply it correctly. The reason why we drop off can be due to a number of factors. Short tracking and muscle switch. Using the smooth bot example again, these are cases where the tracking target makes a movement that is outside of your tracking range. This could be your aiming component, such as fingers or wrist. If you track a target with these, and you've reached the far distance you feel comfortable controlling, and the bot continues to travel, then you're going to drop off. So it's important to not predict this and remain purely reactive. That means if you see a target moving in a certain direction, you need to be aware that if it's going to be for a longer distance, then you need to commit to that by using an aiming component more suited to that range of tracking. Of course, if you're still dropping off, then it could very well be a sensitivity issue. It's good that I use Smoothbot really, because in this task, the target can sometimes have three full rotations around your player. So here I know that I'm not going to use an even higher sensitivity just to do this comfortably. So I'm expecting to drop off here and there for when I adjust. Static approach. As I mentioned in the intro to this video, you can already do these tracking movements. Somebody who has a flicking aim behaviour may find that they have what I call blocky tracking. The whole track is made up of smaller static flicks and this is a bad habit because you just need to practice the full movement motion. I did struggle with this part initially and forcibly had to prevent myself from stopping my mouse so I could then practice and gain the familiarity I needed for my coordination and moving my mouse in this new way. For me personally this is what I felt like was a whole different skill in aiming altogether. I'd been so focused on the A to B distance in one efficient path that I couldn't do A to B in many different inefficient paths. Lag tracking. This is a tough one, but again, it goes back to familiarity. There are cases where you watch a target and follow its movements, but you aren't actually on the target. These are exhibited more in precise tracking scenarios where you feel the need to pay extreme attention to the target path, but in reality, all you need to do is move your mouse that tiny bit quicker. So just do it. I found when I was lag tracking and did this sometimes, I would over flick for sure. But with practice I learnt how to get there smoothly and transition into the tracking speed. So that when I fell off, I could get back on target and match its tracking speed without messing up. Predictive tracking. We mentioned this in the kinetic section of the last video and it's a similar point in this topic too. If you predict the target path and it changes direction, you will continue tracking in the wrong direction for a short while, and the distance between your aim and the target increases, because the target is also now moving away. The natural approach is to flick fast back onto the target, which is more difficult to remain consistent the further out the target is. But then you're likely to stop dead and apply tracking back onto the end of that motion also. Sometimes it can be good to predictive track, but that second part is still not good to do. You must gradually aim back onto the target quickly, but not by flicking your fastest, and follow that motion to match the target speed. It's similar to the second point on the static approach in that sense. Don't block track onto the target and flick to the target's current whereabouts. It's how you lose the target and end up with really messy tracking. I am also going to show a clip from a subscriber in the channel called The Bulletkin. He asked in this clip where he could improve, so we slowed it down. I made a statement. If I see an enemy moving, a 
and my approach is to flick fast and predict his path, if my target changes direction, say 10 milliseconds before my aim gets there, how can I react in time to hit that shot? The result is that you will miss, because you will flip to where the target was. Same point applies in kinetic shooting tasks too. If you try to predict flick all the targets at your faster speeds, then you're going to miss quite a lot because the char uh, target could change path. The reason is because your flick takes time from where you predict the target will be. So it's always better to aim reactively in these scenarios. So in the clip shown, you would want to smooth up to the target and match its movements as opposed to predicting its path flicking as fast as you can. When you work the first one up, it will look similar to the clips I shown in the static task. Now let's look at reactivity. This category is polar opposite of predictive, at least for the parts that are reactive anyway, because tracking is usually in a straight line, so you can always anticipate those movements. The key here, as I said, is to just actually make the movement with your mouse and don't stop moving it so you avoid that static behavior. And what you train is basically, just as it says on the tin, reactivity. When the target drops out of your one-to-one -one coordination and you apply the correct motion back onto it, you build up the correct relationship and you can then start to make it faster. And when you do drop off target, it will look like a fast motion back onto it for sure. Except now you've worked this up consistently. This side of the tracking training is really important because it also helps nurture your reaction time, which is going to keep the gap minimal between your aim and the target. Next, I want to discuss the smooth side of the tracking, and this is basically the challenge when you apply these motions. Whenever I go into any tracking task, I imagine what this would look like if I were to just make the same movement on my mousepad. I apply that regardless of what's on screen, and the real challenge is applying the same speed as the target, which is your smoothness side. Of course it's impossible to maintain the same speed consistently, just as it is to fast flick exact distance consistently. However, it's worth noting that no targets are one pixel wide, so like with a headshot, it does have some excess error margins. So if you move your mouse slightly slower, you may not drop off target if you can recover and pick up your speed again, and same in the headshot scenario. If you flick slightly off your distance, there's a few pixels of the head left on which you can still get your headshot. This skill alone will help you aim more effectively, and it's why tracking is considered to be the greatest of all aim training. It's a relationship more established with your comfort zone for performing certain aiming interactions than when it's just left to your ape-like senses where you just want to maximise your speed. I can explain this in shots, but I want to keep it in simple terms, and I'm just going to use the Windows desktop mouse. If I want to press the minimize button, I will do so smoothly and consistently. I will absolutely not flick to it super fast, but if I grind it out and practice my smooth side and keep making it faster day by day, it will indeed start to look more snappy. However, if you don't push this, you won't improve. So, just like in this example, we aren't very quick because we don't practice it, which is again why it's reason why many people stopped improving their aim many years ago. You have to use these trainers to push your limits and understand how to do them. Now I want to address the high senses better for your tracking statement. I do fully agree with this and it goes back to the static flick approach method. On low sense you have to move physically much faster for your tracking and it leads you to focus more predictively because all of your focus goes on to maintaining the target speed and path. And the reason is because you move a much larger distance on your mouse pad. When a target changes direction or moves, the lower sensitivity will carry on the tracking more predictively. And this makes higher on times extremely difficult because the distance you fall off. There are also other advantages too like not having to use much distance, so you don't adjust as much. There is a control element to this too though, because you could argue your precision suffers on a high sensitivity, so even though motions themselves are easier to do, you might not be able to control it that well precision-wise. But as you know, I'm in favour of building the precision side to increase your control.
And that just about covers the tracking topic in all honesty. These are the only reasons I identify in people's runs and why they are dropping off. And the blocky tracking is actually more existent than you realise. And it's honestly just as simple as making the smooth motion with your mouse and mimicking the exact same thing in your runs. You'll be surprised and you'll start improving considerably. I've hopefully covered by now in this series the main issues with static and kinetic shooting and tracking targets, the smooth and snappy side, and the low sense and the high sense, and how all of this is interlinking together for your overall improvement. I feel understanding is key in learning how to improve because the approach is really important and I want to mention to really push yourself. Don't choose tasks where you can 80% on time and milk out an additional 20%. Go for ones you get 20% in and try to make them 40%, 50% and so on. The next video will be the routines video. It's going to be much shorter but I'm going to try and break them down into useful categories and explain what they do to help you improve. Anyway, peace out guys and I'll catch you in the next one.